Hi you guys, so this is an OCR Gateway Combined Science paper and this is on the higher tier and uh, if you're here for A level then you're probably in the wrong place because this is a GCSE set of questions. Okay, I know A level's tomorrow, check out the live field I did earlier for A level and there's loads of links in the description for that for what you should be doing to prepare for your paper tomorrow. This is for GCSE which is on Friday, paper 2 or paper 4 as they kind of call this in um, separate physics. This is Combined Science, I'm going to follow it with one about the um, triple science but they're useful for both of you so why not just stick around AQA papers I'm going to go through tomorrow this is your last little push now and I know you're tied out but physics for most of you is your last exam you're ready for this so just um, relax go in there and show your qualities when I go through this uh, paper don't focus on what the answers are focus on how I solve the problems because that really is the key to doing well on physics papers how do you solve those problems in front of you the answers will be different but the way in which this, the problems are solved will be very similar. Okay, so um, here it is, and here we go, let's jump straight in. Um, I will stop and look at the chat if there's any kind of live chat going on at the minute, um, going on throughout, but let's just jump straight in. With the multiple choice, then try your best to answer it without looking at the question first. So this asks you to calculate the potential energy of the football when it's 0.8 metres above the ground. Football has a mass of 400 grams. Okay, so you convert that to kilograms first. Use the constant gravitational field strength 10. Um, now this should be a bit of a clue, but you're also looking at calculating some potential energy. So you need to memorise this equation. The potential energy, gravitational potential energy, is mgh, mass times gravitational field strength times height. So you put all those numbers in um, in the right order. You want to use kilograms, you don't get rid of the kilo in that case. So the answer is B. Um, the national grid transfers energy using high voltages. Why are high voltages more efficient? So this is this point in um, the kind of energy section and the national grid the global challenges section that uh, current causes heating and that comes back quite a lot in this GCSE so which is the one where you decrease the current well it's these two um, what is it that the transformers do they increase the voltage so therefore decrease the current which heats the wires less so the answer is D in this case. We want to reduce heat loss and don't forget to get in P is I squared R for explaining how heat loss is um, proportional to current squared. So a little bit of extra current increases the heat loss a lot. Okay, which factors affect braking distance and not thinking distance? So think very carefully. Affect braking distance but not thinking distance. Drinking alcohol in a car full of people, that affects thinking distance. Speed and um, drinking alcohol that affects uh, both braking distance and thinking distance but that only thinking distance so this is both um, speed and wet road conditions this affects braking distance and thinking distance so this is both and wet road conditions and a car full of people they affect braking distance but mm, no, actually not uh, thinking distance, so this should be B. Now I, I think they've made an error on this one actually, I don't think this is a very good question at all because a car full of people, well actually the car full of people would affect braking distance because it would have a higher mass okay now it doesn't say anything about this car full of people being uh, distraction or anything like that so that is the, the solution to this problem in fact, so D. Tricky one, tough one, I, I think they've messed up on that one somewhere. And the mark scheme wasn't quite that, but anyway, let's move on. So parallel beam of white light is reflected from a flat mirror. Okay, which diagram shows the beam reflected correctly? Well, this is just the law of reflection, so the answer is D here. Mirrors don't scatter light in this way, and they certainly don't um, uh, disperse light into a visible spectrum. Which road gives the features of domestic electric, uh, electricity supply in the UK? So they're not. it's not direct current. So it's got to be one of these two. It is 50 hertz, so it's got to be this one. And it is 230 volts. So this is just about getting these two numbers look the right way around. Okay, so it is this one. Um, which row would increase the efficiency of machine? So decreasing the energy input without changing the energy output. Okay, so less energy in for more energy, for the same energy out, then yes, that would increase the efficiency. Increased energy losses due to friction. Well, no, you want to reduce the energy loss if possible, so it's still one of these two, it doesn't get anything any closer. Increased work output without changing the work input. Yes, that is going to be higher energy efficiency. So remember, efficiency 
is the useful energy transferred or power transferred if you like divided by the total so this is your key to understand this one okay um, this is about refraction red light refracts when it enters glass from air so here's just remember this kind of statement about refraction air is less optically dense and glass is more optically dense okay so that's going to help us solve this problem the red light is replaced by blue light which statement about the refraction of blue light is correct okay and look at the look at this care be really careful because they say not correct sometimes or correct sometimes it refracts less than red because its speed in glass is greater than no okay so that is not the case red refracts the least it refracts less than red because its speed so no again it red refracts the least it refracts more than red because its speed in glass is greater than that of red light. Well, no, that's that's not the case, okay? Because it does refract more, but that is because its speed in glass is less than that of red light. So what it is, refraction is um, the amount of refraction is basically uh, it's not proportional, but it's equivalent to how much um, the wave slows down in the more optically dense medium. The most abundant form of radium is radium two two six. So that's the isotope number, okay, that is protons and neutrons, and that's how we solve these problems. That's the mass number, it's the total number of protons and neutrons. Make sure that you know your atomic model like the back of your hand because they're easy marks to lose if you don't really get it very well. So nuclear mass is 226, and its nucleus contains 138 neutrons. So which of the following is an isotope of radium? So although you haven't got a period of table, you can work out the proton number in... Um, radium is 88 so you just do 226 take away 138 and that gives you 88 so you're just looking through this which one also has 88 protons an isotope same number of neutron so same number of protons different number of neutrons okay and doing all if you do this take away this this is the only one that gives you 88 again so the answer is d 10 joules of work is done lifting a ball a distance 1.8 meters how much force was used to lift the ball so this is do you know the equation work done is force times distance can you rearrange it into force equals work done over distance can you then put the work 10 distance 1.8 and do that into a calculator do some rounding to 5.6 and the answer is c so although this is only worth one mark there's quite a lot of thinking there so this is why i suggest you don't spend an awful lot of time struggling over these save these and come back to them later if you like a kettle full of water takes three minutes to boil so you see three minutes and we never use minutes in physics so you straight away convert that into seconds it has a power output of two kilowatts again we don't use kilowatts so we use kilograms but we don't use kilowatts we only ever use kilo in kilograms so we convert straight away to watts. So power is 2,000 watts. And then the equation that you need to memorize for this one is energy equals power times time. 2,000 watts is the power, 180 seconds is the time. So multiply them together and gives you 360,000, so A. Okay, moving on now. Now I didn't do this one on this one because it's the same as the foundation paper. Hard to meet, bear with. Okay, which is quite a complicated little one, really. Okay, and you could go back to the other video, but just for kind of so you don't need to, I'll go through this one one more time. Remember this idea of I squared R, so it's about reducing current, so we reduce the heating, reducing the power loss. Okay, so whenever you get a six mark question, a quality of written communication question, always look to identify two kind of uh, paragraphs that you can write. So the first paragraph, the first kind of mini question, sub question if you like, is compare the two circuits, including reasons why the transformers make a difference. Okay, so you can see this first circuit has got transformers, a step up transformer into the resistance wires and a step down transformer into the bulb. And it's brighter therefore than this. So that's my first paragraph, talk about the job of step up and step down transformers and it's the same idea from the national grid. Suggest how circuit one could be improved to make the bulb glow more brightly. So that's my second paragraph. It's something completely different. It's not them comparing to circuit two, but it's talking about other ways in which we could increase the brightness of this bulb here. So the first few statements really are just about has the transformers. First transformer raises the voltage, so lowers the current. Second transformer lowers the voltage, so raises the current again. So the voltage isn't higher than 12, so the bulb doesn't blow. Okay, there's all the statements I've made there. I did talk about in here, you get less heating effect of current because you've reduced the current. Okay. 
This means that the bulb in circuit one is brighter. And why is it brighter? Because this whole system is more efficient. So when you're talking about transformers and the national grid, you're talking about increasing the efficiency of the whole system, less power loss in the system. And then lastly, the second um, paragraph that I've identified suggests other ways in which we can improve the circuit. And that's about these resistance wires. So we can make them shorter. So really, it's asking, do you understand that length is proportional to resistance? So if we decrease the resistance, we get a higher efficiency as well. You could also make them a lower resistivity material. Okay, so that's in here as well. Or you could increase the thickness of the wires because a thicker wire has a lower resistance as well. The other one you could do is you could in fact make this a greater change, so you could have an even lower current. So you could, you could change the ratio of primary to secondary turns, have a higher number of secondary turns to primary in this one, and hey presto, you've got a more efficient system because you've got even lower, you've got an even lower current. Okay, so um, the next one here is about washing machines. Okay, they have an outer casing made of metal, and you should know about a safety feature due to um, for metal appliances being an earth wire and the earth is connected to the casing so if you see this you see earth wire and or you see um, a fuse then you bang down your set explanation of how an earth wire and a fuse work together to keep the user safe so basically the casing is earthed and what is an earth okay I'm going to define that and that's going to be my first mark an earth is a path of low resistance it's sometimes called a grounding Okay, but earth is a path of low resistance mark. This means the charge flows to earth rather than a user. Okay, so the charge goes to earth when there's a surge of current. So that this high current that we might get with when we've got this fault is transferred through the low resistance rather than through the higher resistance of the user. Okay, um, lastly, then this happens when the fuse melts. And I've, I've just added in here, it wasn't in the mark scheme, but it often is. Fuse melts, circuit breaks. Okay, so that is just an explanation for, for how a fuse and, a, and an earth wire work together. Um, fuse melts, circuit breaks, uh, current flows to earth, which is a path of really low resistance. So get those points down and you'll get the marks there. So just why the earth wire is thicker. We talked about thickness and resistance just a little while ago. Essentially, thicker wire, lower resistance, and we want our, um, we want our Earth wires have the lowest possible resistance. Yeah, shout out to Voyager, shout out to QK. I hope it's going well to you guys as well. Um, I'll have a little look if there's any chat um, from you guys or anyone in a little while. Okay, so this one, if you've watched the, the foundation tier paper, then this is an interesting one um, because it looks very similar, but they've increased the difficulty of these questions using the same contents. All right, so say two changes to an electric wave electromagnetic wave when it travels from a medium of low density to high density so it goes into a more optically dense medium the wave speed decreases and the wave length decreases that's a really important thing because the frequency doesn't change so if it's my low density this is my high density material then when it goes from here we get the refraction the frequency stays the same because we need to have the same number of waves hitting the medium per second so the frequency stays the same and in fact we define color as the frequency because of that anyway that was the solution to this frequency is fixed okay if you think about this equation v is f lambda frequency is fixed in this case and uh, lambda is the thing that changes because wave speed changes because it's harder for the wave to get through the more optically dense material right so so moving um Moving on to the microwave and the chocolate. Okay, so this is a way, in fact, I used to, do, I remember doing this a lot at Voyager Academy um, back in the day. I used to do the cheese plate, in fact. Um, in fact, you can just take the rotating plate, so what it says in here, out of a microwave. You can turn on the power for a short amount of time and you get like heat spots. You get certain parts are cooked whilst other parts are not cooked. Um, and that is equivalent to half the wavelength because essentially it cooks. Um, where the, 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 the wave is oscillating up and down but doesn't cook in the bit where it, it isn't oscillating up and down. Okay. So anyway, the first thing to do is what's the wavelength of this microwave in meters? They've shown you this, the position of the spots on a diagram, and you needed to recognize that the difference between these, the distance between these two spots was half a wavelength. Okay, half a wavelength. So um, you need to measure accurately using the little ruler that they've given you here. You need to measure accurately the distance there. And the way I suggest you do that, you've got to think of the center of the two spots. So you could almost think, well, what's the two edges? And then kind of half that to do that. 
or you just need to really carefully line up the center because the answer, the, this is 41 millimeters they're asking you and they wouldn't accept 40. So you need to use, if they give you some of this, then you need to use it really accurate to kind of half a small um, scale division, that kind of accuracy there. So if the wavelength over two is 41 millimeters and the full wavelength is 82 millimeters. So 0.82 um, meters is the wavelength, because that's three in meters. You then go to use that in an equation to calculate a wave speed. The frequency of the microwave is 4, 000, uh, sorry, 2,450 megahertz, and you need to know what a mega means. Okay, a mega is a million. Okay, now a million, or in other words, is six zero. So I suggest if you see mega and you want to get rid of it, you just change the number to two. Um, 450 times 10 to the 6 hertz. I'm going to show you how to type that into the calculator in a second if you don't know. First mark on this is just do you remember the formula wave speed is frequency times wavelength? Okay, yes, we do. We get a mark. Can we put the numbers in the right place? The second mark, okay, with the conversions. Yes, we can. We do the second mark. And then can we actually do that calculator the calculation correctly in the calculator? And there's that times 10 to the 6 button. Okay, now it treats, the calculator treats that as one number. It didn't really show up very well on my calculator screen there, so I'll just do this one more time. 2, 4, 5, 0 times 10 to the 6 is the way to type in that number. Easy peasy. And then you times that by the wavelength in meters that you did from the last question. And hey presto, all of those there. Now I just suggest that when you do write this down, that you really carefully count off the zeros. And if you do it in groups of zeros, groups of three zeros, then you're less likely to make an error. Okay. Yeah, I'll take questions, have a little look at the chat in just a little while. Okay, um, I did have a look at this and thought, hmm, this is the answer I get, 2.01, I rounded to some significant figures. You don't necessarily have to do that, they will accept this as the answer there. I did actually do that. Um, and then I thought, hmm, that's interesting because that's lower than the speed of light in a vacuum, but it's not in a vacuum, this is, um, this is in the speed in chocolate interesting right so the speed of all electromagnetic waves in air is approximately three times ten to the eight okay how far apart should the spots have been so this is if the spots were in air so essentially this is the frequency is fixed in all mediums so you can reuse our v is f lambda equation our wave speed is frequency times wavelength rearrange for wavelength so you get wave speed over frequency they've given you the wave speed as it should be the frequency is the fixed thing from the previous question, and then the answer is 0 0.122. So again, how do you do that in the calculator? Hit the fraction button, 3 times 10 to the 8, um, move down the, the level of the fraction, 2, 4, 5, 0 times 10 to the 6. You just put all those numbers in the calculator, understands that, boom. Hit the D button because you want a decimal, 0 0.122. Now, don't forget though, what I've calculated so far is the wavelength and it didn't ask me that it asked for how far apart the spots were so the spots were half a wavelength apart so actually you need to half that to get your final answer there so a mark for being able to rearrange and sub the numbers in a mark for 1 to 0 0.122 and your final mark in this case was for having half that because it asked you and it did tell you about that so be, make sure you're really careful in the way that you analyze the questions the investigation is repeated with bread dough why is the wavelength measured different in chocolate? Well, this is just because wave speed is different in bread to the wave speed in chocolate. Wave speed depends on the medium. Okay, wave speed is always the same within a given medium. Okay, so if it's deeper water, it might be quicker, shallower water, but that's a change in the medium. Okay, question 13 then. Some nuclei are radioactive because they are unstable. In the terms half-life and random decay are used when describing radioactivity. Explain the concept of a half-life. The half-life is the average time taken. Now, it's a really important thing to understand here. Loads of people make mistakes, especially in combined science, on half-life questions. For the number of active nuclei in a sample to decay by half. I missed that out there, didn't I? So I didn't obviously read back, <laughs> read back through. Right? The number of, basically, the y-axis to half. It could be the activity or it could be the number of active nuclei, it doesn't matter. Whatever is on the y-axis, is the half-life is a time it takes to half. Now here's just to, to clear up the kind of misunderstanding that a lot of people seem to have. The first half-life, okay, um, the, the, the radioactive decay, uh, the radioactivity decays by half. 
Now that doesn't mean in the second half-life that the rest of it goes and it's a zero. So it's not like a half-life is half of the full life, which seems to be a kind of concept. If the time taken for the, for the activity to half, okay, is fixed. So in that same time period, the activity halves again. Then it would half again. Then it would half again. So it keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, halving every single half-life, every single time period in which it halves. So that is a really important thing. So why is radioactive de decay described as random? It's because it's not possible to predict when an individual atom will decay. There's a probability of any atom decaying, but you can't say, right, that one's going to go then. And you can't influence it either. Okay? But what does it mean when we say something's random is you can't predict it. You can't predict when an individual atom will decay. And it's why we model them often with dice, because dice, in the same way, there's a probability of rolling a six, but you can't say which dice is going to get a six at, at which time. So a student collects information about the half-life of francium. Calculate the half-life of francium. Now, actually, what you should do is you should do two half-lives. But I'll just show you the kind of simple way they're expecting you to get full marks on this one. It's nice and easy. You just go for whatever number is the, the y-intercept um, on, on the y-axis, okay? And that's 80. You half that. Hopefully, you can see my pencil line carefully with a sharp pencil across to the line, carefully down to the line. And remember, we're expecting use of graphs with half a small square accuracy. So that number there is halfway between 10 and, and 20, so it's 15, and that was the answer. Now just want to draw your attention to this, even people who write questions make mistakes. If you were to do the second half life, which you really should, because it's the average time, and go across the line, you don't come out at 30 where you should. So they have not drawn this line accurately. Okay, so I'll leave that out of that. Essentially, just pay attention to this skill, Take whatever is on the y-axis, half it across to the line and down to the time axis. The half-life is the time it took to half. Okay, calculate the net decline expressed as a ratio during radioactive emission after three half-lives. So when three half-lives are passed, it's halved once, it's halved twice, and it's halved again. So you do a half times a half times a half. And that equals one eighth. Now that means there's one eighth left. So it's declined, and you get a mark for having one eighth basically, or a half times a half times a half. Okay? Um, the, the net decline is seven eighths, because that's how many have gone. And I'll just say it is, this is not the same as three times a half, because three times a half is 1.5. And it's not that. Okay? So it, it, it is three half lives is a half cubed or half to the power of three so four half lives would be half to the power of four etc cotton wool buds have been irradiated but not contaminated it's how we step one way we can use gamma rays is we can sterilize things okay so um describe the difference between being irradiated and contaminated this is something they really want you to know the difference in risk between irradiation and contamination irradiation is quite a low risk right because irradiation is exposure to radiative particles like alpha beta or gamma hitting something basically Contamination is a leak or a spill of a radioactive source or a radioactive material or an isotope. So if, if the source, the material, has got into something where it shouldn't be, that's contamination. If it's just given out a few of its radioactive particles and then you've taken it away, as irradiation, it could cause ionizations, it could be bad, but it's only temporary, so it's less of a risk. Contamination poses a longer-term risk. So the higher the risk, so, that, so it's a high risk. Irradiation is only as long as the exposure. Now, I've done kind of all that you need to do. If you said one of these two things, um, so if you said just one of these things, that contamination is a lower, uh, sorry, a, contamination is a longer risk, then that implies that the irradiation is a shorter risk. Okay, so, so that, that's okay. Next one, then, the um, radiator question here. The radiator is full of water. There's a little clue in that. Describe the energy transfer. So you just have to describe, you don't have to explain them or anything like that, why they take place, you just have to describe them. That are taking place. Assume no energy is lost from the room. Another little clue there. So think about these energy analysis questions in terms of the firm, the, so the energy stores. So think about the thermal energy store of the water as it goes into the radiator is transferred by heating to thermal energy stores of the radiator metal and the radiator and the room. You only need, you need one of them. But essentially, the thermal energy store in the radiator is decreasing and the thermal energy store of the room is increasing. 
Now this means the temperature of the water decreases as that thermal energy store has decreased. So there is a difference between temperature and energy and I hope you're kind of familiar with that um, and you needed to get that in there for that second mark. So there is a temperature change of 3 degrees Celsius in the room. This is caused by the radiator giving out 18,900 joules of energy per second. The specific heat capacity of water is this. Calculate the mass of water flowing through the radiator to cause it to give out this much energy each second. Okay, now they did tell you that there was no energy lost from the room, so that's why this 3 degrees Celsius is what we can use in this calculation here. Essentially, do you remember that energy is mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change? You get a mark for that and to rearrange it into mass in this case because it's asked you to calculate the mass. Look carefully for what it's going to calculate that. Okay, then plug in the energy and it's in joules already so we can use it in joules and the specific heat capacity and the temperature change. Now be careful of that because often they'll give you a starting temperature and a final temperature or a final temperature and a starting temperature. The answer is 1.5 kilograms and that's your final answer. That's your final mark. Then they give you a little picture, a diagram of the system. The picture shows the radiators in the house connected by pipes to the boiler. So the main boiler can be replaced to improve efficiency. Describe three ways the efficiency of the pipe system can be improved, right? Describe three ways the pipes can be improved. So I've told you about that we could replace the boiler, but that's not what the question is asking, is it? It's asking about the pipe system. What can you do then? You can lag them. You can put thermal insulation to reduce heat loss by conduction. I've added that in brackets because you didn't really need it for the mark, but I thought it illustrated my point. Um, shorter pipes that give. Um, if you use shorter pipes, then you'll lose less heat because they'll be in the pipes for less less distance. You could use pipes with a smaller surface area to volume ratio. Now, either of those is good for this second mark. Okay. You could also, though, paint the pipes a light and shiny colour, or you could cover them in foil, maybe, okay? And that would reduce the heat loss by radiation. So, here I've really thought about um, how am I going to stop conduction in this case, or reduce conduction in this case, by insulating it? How am I going to stop radiation by painting the pipes light and shiny? Okay, so just a couple more questions now. One more question on road safety. Yeah. Okay, so the stopping distance of a car is important for road safety. Okay, get that. One factor that affects stopping distance is reaction time. So that's what we're going to start talking about. The instructions below are for a reaction time test. Okay, so basically you wait for the lights to change and then you hit the button. Use the experiment above to write a method to compare the reaction time with different distractions. So we have to write a method. In your method, describe the variables you have controlled and you, how you've made the test precise. Now, what I've just done there, I've illustrated to you, hopefully, you should look for and underline the command words. If you underline the command words, then you're going to be more likely to make sure that you hit all of the things on the mark scheme because the marks are always linked to command words. If they haven't told you to do it, then they can't really assess you on it. Okay, so think about it like that. So first of all, write in a method. So we're going to test groups of different stu of, of test groups of students' reaction time with different distractions. Okay, that's the first mark I think, and th you should list out at least two distractions so they, they know that. So it could be shouting, music, flashing lights, etc. You should really compare that to a control group for no distractions, but that that we'll just leave it there. You go. How do you make it precise then? So that's the second mark. How do you make it precise? Well, you could use a ruler with a millimeter scale. Okay. Um, although we've used this experiment, so it shouldn't be the, the ruler with a millimetre drop uh, scale, so I'm going to leave that. Okay, so how can we make it precise? We can repeat it, discard anomalies, and calculate a mean, because we're going to get a lot of random errors. Okay, We're going to get, if you repeat this three times, they're never going to be exactly the same. So repeat, discard anomalies, and calculate a mean is a great stock phrase for when you're thinking about anything that's got a random error, a random uncertainty. You've got to control other variables, though, like the time of day or no stimulants, etc. Okay, so you, any other control variable like that, okay, that, that, that could also change. Now I've been quite detailed in that, but if you are just um, if if you just give kind of one of these things, control a variable like the time of day, or make sure that students aren't drinking more, more caffeine than another one, then that would be good enough. But I just thought I'd list another couple of examples. Okay, so the table shows six of the results collected. There's six results. And then it says select three reaction times on the table when there were no distractions and calculate the mean of these. So the first thing I thought is, oh, this is calculating a mean. 
the only way to do that, I'm going to check for anomalies. But then I saw, well, oh look, there's only one blooming mark for this. So they're probably not testing me on two skills at once. But secretly they were, because they're asking me for three of them. So I have to pick three when there were no distractions. So actually they're testing me to apply my knowledge that distractions increase uh, reaction time. So I'm looking for the three shortest ones. So I've calculated the mean of the three of them. Now so many people, when they see this, are not going to be careful. They're going to say, oh, calculate the mean question, great, I can do this. And they calculate the mean of all six, and it comes out of not that. All right, so just be really, really careful that you actually ensure that you're answering the question in front of you, not just what you think the question is on first glance, a question that you've seen that's similar to this one, but isn't this question. State why it's important for the driver to not be distracted. Distractions increase reaction time, so therefore they increase thinking distance. So hopefully you're familiar with this idea that stopping distance is equal to the sum of thinking distance plus um, braking distance, right? And there's loads on this in this module in OCR gateway. All right. Another factor that affects stopping distance is braking distance. Okay, so we'll just talk about that. Um, the graph shows braking distances for tyres of different tread depths on concrete and tarmac. So let's just interpret the graph before we go ahead and use it. The car, remember, is always travelling at the same speed, so they've told us that's controlled between these two lines here. This is deeper treads, nice deep wheel treads, okay, and this is shallower treads, okay, so okay, now I know what I'm talking about. I'm expecting this is going to increase braking distance, aren't I? Okay, so the legal minimum, and that's not as easy as that, okay, so we can see that generally the, the braking distance is increasing. The legal minimum for tyre minimum for tread depth is 1.6 millimetres. What conclusions can you make about the graph for tread depth on different surfaces, how that affects braking distances? Use data from the graph. So we need to make some conclusions here. So let's have a little look at how many we can do. Oh, we can probably get four. So lower tread depth gives a higher braking distance. Nice and easy for a starter. Okay, we get the mark. Get that nice simple conclusion in there first. Then, well, braking distance look increases more rapidly after about five millimeters. Okay, on this one, and after about three or four millimeters on this one. So actually, that's a very important thing. Braking distance increases more rapidly from between four to three millimeters than above this. And then the concrete has a greater braking distance for all tread depths. Can you see that? So always, no matter what the tread depth, concrete has a higher braking distance than the tarmac does, okay? So what conclusion can we make from that then? You could say something like the concrete is going to be a less safe road because the braking distance is larger, so there's more likely to be accidents. That's what they were looking for. Last one then, and this is a motion graph, a velocity time graph in this um, case. So shade the section which shows the braking distance. Now a velocity time graph, the area underneath the graph is the distance. Okay, so it's actually this section here which I've shaded in pencil already. Okay. That was just worth one mark, okay. The braking distance, the speed is going to be re reducing over the braking distance, all right? Use the graph to calculate the stopping distance of the car, so you need to know the stopping distance is both thinking distance, this section, and braking distance, and show you're working. Well, it's the area underneath the graph, okay? So all you need to do then is work out the area of this rectangle here. So again, graphs, half a small square accuracy is what we're looking for. So this is 1.6 seconds, and this height is 34. Is it 34 or is it 35? 35. Apologies. See how easy it is to make mistakes. Um, so I need to reevaluate this one then. So the area of that rectangle is 1.6 times 35, and the area of this triangle is a half times 35 times the base. And just carefully look, this was 1.6 and that was 6.5, so this distance is 4.9. Okay, so that's the base there. Now back into the calculator, I can type that all in a wanna. Hundred and forty one. I'll write that there because I'm going to do some rounding before I put it in my answer box. One hundred forty two meters. Okay, so um, that just shows you, doesn't it, that when we as teachers say check your work in, if you've got time at the end, go through and check all your work in again. 
because you can easily make mistakes. Now I'm not at all embarrassed about that because if you do these papers under pressure, you'll make mistakes. And I just did this one earlier in like, you know, less than the exam time, okay? But the skill is check in because if you check through your work in, you will spot those errors. If you really just think through every step of the way again, you will spot those errors, you can make those corrections and you can do your answers. I will just say as well, careful not to do, um, certainly not for your answer, don't overwrite your answer, cross it out and put your answer clearly next to it. We will, as examiners, mark the entire box. If you need to go elsewhere, just put an arrow to show that you've done it somewhere else on the page. Right, um, that's all my chat for this GCSE. I'll just have a little look at the chat because there's a few people that have been um, talking on here and wondering what's coming up next. So here comes this guy. Okay, so um, yeah, this this isn't for AQA. This was for OCR Gateway. Okay, so I've got one more set of questions coming up, which are um, which are uh, separate science OCR Gateway. Okay, I'm going to do that in about sort of half an hour, and um, the uh, AQA stuff I'm going to do tomorrow because I know most people out there are AQA. So I've got some videos coming for AQA Paper Two and I'm going to do a quick live feed on AQA paper too. Uh, there's a couple of questions here as well. Could I go over light, so waves and things like that? There was some stuff in there as well about waves. Did a bit of refraction in there, cryptic god, so hopefully that helps as well. Um, Halimi, I'm, I'm sorry if you didn't understand. I suggest you watch that again, maybe look through um, look through the, the uh, chat, look, look through the video once more and then maybe find videos on the topics that you didn't understand. Okay, I do explain things at quite a high level. I, I know that, all right. Um, an alternator, okay, an, an alternator is a generator which produces gen, um, alternating currents. I'll do that tomorrow because that's an AQA thing, I know that as well. I'm really glad to see QKA up, up in this piece. Okay, nice to see you guys. Uh, I thought electricity was just on paper one. So Logan, Paul, um, glad to see that you're getting your um, education. Um, <laughs> it is on paper one for AQA, but it's on paper two. Oh, so no, no, it's, it, it, electricity is on paper one for OCR, but then they've got this section on the national grid really as part of um, the global challenges. So they can challenge you to apply some of your knowledge of of um, electricity on paper two as well. So well, I made this point to my class that actually you need to know the equations from paper one. They're not just used for that. There's a lot of things in there. Yeah, I can take questions. Vector diagrams to illustrate e equilibrium situations. Yeah, I can do that quickly. Let's jump into the visualizer and then I'll go back to the chat briefly. Okay, so there's a few different equilibrium situations with any vector. If we just think about in one dimension, if we've got two forces on an object that are both equal then the sum of these forces will be zero. Okay, that's an equilibrium situation. Now, what if we have three forces on that object? Okay, now if we drew this accurately, let's say I had 10 here, and I was pulling, um, trying to make sure that I get this right, like six in this direction and eight in this direction then actually I could show that these were in equilibrium by doing the 10, then the 6, then the 8. And if I drew this accurately, if they were in equilibrium, then this little triangle would close. Okay, so this is called a vector triangle. Now if they weren't in equilibrium, let's do a second situation. Incidentally, this, this would be a right angle triangle um, which is a 3, 4, 5 triangle, so 3, 4 and 5. But uh, I'll leave that, that to there. You could draw it accurately with a scale and with a protractor and they'd have to give you these angles and tell you what they were if they were expecting you to draw that accurately. And it would say on the front of your paper you need a protractor for this paper if they were expecting you to do that. Um, if they weren't equal, let's say this was 15 newtons. And I'll do the same to, to illustrate my point. Then... Um, my vector triangle looked like this, 15, 6, 8. Doesn't close, so is not in equilibrium. In fact, there's a resultant force 
which is whatever that value is just there okay on the scale uh, diagram that we drew hope that helps with your question go back into the chat now We say it means a half life of a neutron. I don't know if that's an uh, if that's a um, a level question or otherwise. But basically, all, all particles have a probability of decaying, and neutrons are made up of actually three sub um, not subatomic three quarks, which are the particles that make up hadrons. Okay, so there, there's a probability at any point that that could just decay, and it's quite a low prob norm probability with neutrons normally. So the half life therefore would be very very long. Denver, Mr. Denver, it's biology as well. <laughs> Triple science coming next. <laughs> Redshift and how it supports the Big Bang model. I think there's a question coming up on this on the next um, the next feed. So just watch that. <laughs> All right, thanks, Biraj. Okay, just going to really quickly do just a little bit more chat about what's coming next. I hope that was helpful. I'll be back tomorrow for AQA chat and a few AQA questions as well. Stay tuned for that. Stay tuned if you're going into A-level physics and stay tuned if you're going into other science as well because I'll be expanding my channel next year. And also if you've got questions that you want particularly to go through tomorrow night um, for any GCSE at all, then do ask them. Don't ask them now in the live feed. Put them in the comments of a video because I see those comments a bit more readily. Um, and I will try my best tomorrow night to respond to a few of those questions. Okay, these I hope you'll see are useful for every exam board, even though they are OCR questions, and the AQA ones will be too. Okay, so maybe like 25 minutes, and I'll be back for triple science questions. I'll schedule it. And I'll see you then.